would like to talk about music, math, and the mind. Yeah, whatever, Teach. It's not like I'm going to ever need this in real life. <laughs> what did you just do with your mouth? What? That sound. It was like a fart sound. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. You exerted pressure on your lips with the air in your lungs in such a way that my brain recognized it as a fart. Yeah, listen. But how did my brain know you meant to sound like a fart? Well, there's a physiological process that is taking place almost instantaneously, and science is at the heart of that process, quantifying it into measurable increments. What? There is so much about music, math, and the mind that is just so fascinating. The ear is made up of three parts, the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. It all starts when a sound wave hits the outer part of our ear, also called the pinna. The waves are amplified and then sent into the ear canal. The sound waves that encounter the eardrum, also called the tympanic membrane. The eardrum turns this air pressure into mechanical energy and transfers it into three small bones called the ossicles. The ossicles are made up of the hammer, malus, anvil, incus, and stirrup, stapes. The stirrup vibrates this energy to the cochlea, also called the snail. The cochlea is a liquid-filled spiral lined with hair cells. The hair cells in the cochlea are super important because they do the job of mechanotransduction. That's a nice fancy word. Basically, the hair cells are turning the mechanical vibrations of the stirrup into electrical signals the brain can process. Isn't it crazy that a spirally hairy snail is in our ear and it's responsible for our ability to hear? It's nuts. This is a solid overview, but there's a lot of details missing. There's so much more to learn, like how snakes have a eustachian tube connected to their jawbone to listen to lower vibrations. Music can help improve the cognitive function of people living with dementia, and we can increase the speed of sound by increasing the temperature and pressure of the medium through which it's traveling. It's also heckin' cool! Now it's cool to look at the wide range of subjects that pertain to music in the mind, but now I want to focus on one particular subject. I want to focus on methods for quantifying neurotransmitter dynamics in the living brain with PET imaging. I know, that's a lot. Let's unpack it. Scientists have had this problem for a real long time. How do brain work? How your brain work? How do you brain? Well, the brain is the most complicated organ in the body, but we know that neurotransmitters such as dopamine play a big role. But how do we know that? Did we just scoop open someone's head and count the number of dopamine molecules they had? No! Researchers used Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, FMRI. FMRI is a scan that uses a magnetic field to track blood flow in the brain. Now FMRI scans are okay, but the brain is complicated and you're missing out on a lot of details. Now here comes PET imaging. PET imaging, positron emission tomography, is an imaging technique that uses non-invasive radioactive substances to visualize and measure changes in metabolic processes. Whew. Okay, so when PET imaging is used alongside FMRI, oh boy. We can actually measure neurotransmitters in the brain with more detail than if we just did fMRI alone. PET imaging can be used to cross-reference the results of fMRI for more accurate results. This process can help diagnose neurological diseases and show how exogenous and endogenous substances affect our mind. Now, I want to go over some mathematical models that relate to this technique. I highly recommend that you check out the paper yourself, link in the doobly-doo, because there is a lot that I'm simplifying. Gamma variation, time variant and non-variant models, what type of lignans are being used. This video could go on until the cows come home. Also, a lot of dialogue that is being exchanged by the researchers is really awesome. Researchers are so sassy. I just want to focus on this equation. Delta HT is the hemodynamic changes in a part of the brain compared to time. This is blood flow. Remember, the brain controls blood flow, so the brain can hijack the circulatory system into doing some crazy stuff. Equals the sigma of the receptors times the sigma of the lignans. Receptors are the parts of the body that take in signals. Lignans are the chemicals responsible for those signals. Receptors and lignans share a complicated relationship, but their localized ratio in certain parts of the brain is extremely telling of a person's health. Times the neurovascular coupling constant, this is the ratio of the number of receptors to blood, different for different parts of the brain, times the efficiency of the receptors and lignans, how efficiently are the lignans being bound to the receptor, 
times the total concentration of receptors, the total number of receptors in that area of the brain, times the time varying occupancy of the receptors and lignans. Now, what is theta doing in here? Darn trigonometry getting all up in my delta? This is describing the cyclical relationship for receptors to lignans. The body is a chaotic system, and this time-varying model helps reflect that. Sometimes that administered stimulant doesn't take effect right away, or it peaks and then dissipates. Trigonometry in applied science. Booyah! Finally, time, which is self-explanatory. Wow, that was a lot. Let's walk it back one more time. This equation is estimating the amount of hemodynamic change, delta HT, equaling the sigma of the receptors, times the sigma of the lignans, the administered drug or stimulant, times the neurovascular coupling constant of the area of the receptor, determined by the receptors, times the efficiency of the receptor and lignin, times the total concentration of receptors, times the time varying occupancy of the receptors and the lignans, times time. Basically, what this equation is trying to do is summarize the relationship between the receptors and the administered stimulant. This helps researchers analyze 3D scans of the brain voxel by voxel. This is a general model for all lignans, but there can be models for specific neurotransmitters. Here's one for dopamine. Please comment if you see anything wrong with the way I described this relationship. I'd really love to learn and hear any corrections anyone has. Oh, did you, uh, did you have something to say? No, I was just enjoying. Cool stuff. Cool. <laughs> uh, anyways, what's cool about this equation is that we can measure incrementally how much something affects our brain. Many studies use chemicals such as THC to study how substances affect the brain, but some even use music. Imagine a world where you can exactly calculate how happy a song makes you. It's quantifying the qualitative. I think that's so cool. I wanted to end this video with a word about ethics. Humans are weird, and we do a lot of weird stuff. I just hope people can learn enough information to make informed decisions for themselves. Neuromarketing, memory dampening, pharmaceuticals, and a whole bunch of other stuff is present in our world, and I just want people to make healthy decisions. I know the world can feel like a negative place sometimes, but I totally think it's okay to recognize those feelings, as well as the optimism I feel when I get to make cool stuff like this and learn about how music affects us on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure people will take issue with my earlier statement about making the qualitative quantifiable. I could totally understand how that could be interpreted as taking the humanity out of art. However, I think trying to understand and empathize with people is also at the heart of humanity. If you assume that there is no hope, you guarantee that there will be no hope. If you assume that there is an instinct for freedom, that there are opportunities to change things, then there is a possibility that you can contribute to making a better world.